and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Craig. And I'm Todd. And we are continuing our Halloween month. Um, this week was my turn to pick. We've been uh, taking turns. And <laughs> I wasn't sure. You know, there are... Uh, a lot of Halloween movies out there, and some of them look like they have some pretty good potential. Some of them look pretty stupid. Not that I'm above doing stupid movies at all, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> Lord knows we've done a few. <laughs> <laughs> More than a few. But I decided to go a little bit different this week, and I don't know. I, I hope that uh, our loyal fans will respect this decision because it's a, a, a little unorthodox. <laughs> for us. I decided this week that we should do 2006's Monster House, which is a PG-rated family film. Mm. But it is set on Halloween, and it has a lot of horror elements to it. I would kind of describe this as gateway horror for kids, mm. something that's relatively safe for kids to watch, but still with some dark elements and themes and, and some frankly, some pretty serious uh, scares uh, in some places. Yeah. And I just l remembered liking it. I, I hadn't seen it for a long time. Uh, I had seen it before. I don't remember when the last time I saw it was. But I remembered being struck by how scary it was for a family film. Now, going back and watching it again, I think that my memory of it was <laughs> I think I remember it being a little scarier than it really was. Yeah. But uh it does definitely have some scary elements and it's just a super super fun Halloween film. I mean it's set on the day before Halloween and Halloween Day and it's just beautiful fall landscape, tons of fun Halloween stuff, you know, jack-o'-lanterns and Halloween costumes and all of that good stuff that really just kind of gets you in the mood for the season. And ultimately, while this time around I didn't find it as scary as I did the first time, I still really enjoyed it. And it was a movie that I could sit and watch with my partner, who's really not a huge fan of horror, and he enjoyed it too. Um, and I think that if you do have kids, um, this is something that they would like and because of that, I'm going to try to watch my language during this podcast so that if you do have kids, <laughs> maybe they could listen to this with you. <laughs> you mean I'm not going to have to bleep out any F-bombs this time I'm, I'm going to try really hard. I promise nothing, but I'll, I'm going to try. So uh, what about you, Todd? Any history with this? Had you seen it before? I had seen it before. I don't remember when. It was probably around the time it came out. I watched it. And I, actually, I get this movie confused a lot with Paranorman. Uh -huh. Another good one. One. Another good one, animated in a very different style, right? This one, sometimes I discover nice little things as the credits are coming up that get me interested, and I didn't realize this was an Image Movers production. Yeah. And Image Movers was, um, it's not around anymore, but it was a, a studio, kind of a technology created by Robert Zemeckis and his team. It's basically a motion capture technology. Yeah. and. At first, you know, when I heard about it, I thought, oh, you know, back in the day, I thought, oh, a motion capture, we're doing that now, it's no big deal. But what these guys did is they had a whole large room, basically, and there were cameras everywhere in the room. And, of course, the actors would wear these motion cap dots and things on their faces and whatnot, but it was entirely just performing in this space. And there's nobody walking around with a camera capturing things from different angles. And so I actually watched a little documentary about uh, Image Movers some time ago. And I think it was around, because I really like that Jim Carrey movie. Oh, yeah, the Christmas one, right? Yeah, I, I think that's the last one that they did before they kind of stopped that, closed that studio down. But it started out with another Christmas one, right? The Train. Polar Express. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which creeped people out because it, it went into that uncanny valley yeah. level of, of animation, which... I didn't mind so much. No, Jim I still Carrey liked one it. has a little bit of that, too. I, I thought it was still fun. Anyway, Jim Carrey talked about how freeing that method was because you know you could just perform. You could just act. 
you didn't have to worry about hitting your mark or where the camera is pointing and not to look at the camera. You could just get back to acting school, you know, on the stage uh, and just perform as an actor and not have to worry about all those technical things. And so once he described it and I kind of saw some video of this behind the scenes production, I thought, oh, God, yeah, that would be quite nice. And then afterwards... You know, they have all the data of how everything was laid out and positioned and the movement and everything like that. So then inside the computer, they can set up the camera anywhere they want. And then the animators can, of course, augment it with other stuff. And they certainly did that here. This doesn't fall into that uncanny valley trap because although this was, I believe, in production short, maybe at the same time that the Polar Express was being was being put together. They took a different look for the animation. They made it a lot more cartoony. And I think that was a choice by the writer-directors to make it more cartoony because this is about an evil house. Mm-hmm. And we're not talking about a haunted house where evil things happen inside the house. The house itself is a monster. <laughs> yeah. Which, it's just a really cool and interesting concept. I mean... You know, to some extent, every haunted house movie, the house is quote unquote a monster, but not quite this literally, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so that's what I find really charming about this movie. And that's probably why this works so much better in animation than it would any other way, because then they could really focus and, and the, the, mo- the the house could become a full fledged monster by the end of it and go places and do things and transform in any way that it wants without being hindered by technology and without feeling kind of lifted out of the world you know, that it's in. It's a little more fantastical concept. So that just seems to naturally lend itself a little bit better to to animation. And especially for kids, right? Because as you said, this is more family friendly. I mean, certainly we've done other PG rated family friendly horror movies. But like you said, this one is a little different from what we've done because I'm not sure we've done an animated movie yet on this show. Have we? Oh, man. I don't know. You know what? I don't think we have. We've talked about it. We did a a whole month of family-friendly films, and at the time, there were so many that we were interested in that we decided to break it up, and we decided to do live-action ones first, and then we said we would return to it at some point and do a month of animated ones, because there are other great animated ones. Like, you mentioned... um, Paranorman, which is great. Coraline is another really good one. There's one, Uzumaki. I think it's a Korean hand-drawn animation one somebody requested quite some time back. Yeah. It's been on our list for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and there are, you know, animated films that are not intended to be family-friendly ones that I've been interested in. I know that there's a um, an animated sequel to Train to Busan that I have really been interested in seeing. Oh, really? But I, yeah, but I haven't wow. gotten around to watching it. But uh, this movie, as I was watching it last night, I was actually thinking, you know, as we are talking about it, I feel like... If somebody hadn't seen it and they didn't know that it was an animated film, if we were just talking about the plot and the things that happen, it still feels very much like a horror film. Now, granted, a horror film that focuses on kids, which I love. I love movies that have children protagonists just because I think that the kid perspective is so unique and interesting and children are – at a, an age where you know it's it's easy to believe things and and so the idea of a haunted house which is what they think at first they think it's haunted at first but then you know the fact that the house itself is sentient and more of a monster as it turns out it's possessed it's a possessed house but you know when you're a kid your expectations of reality are still being shaped and yes. so you could mm-hmm. almost you could you could believe in these types of things mm-hmm. and i love that perspective it's just so innocent and fresh and it, it takes me back you know i remember being a kid and having an active animation uh, imagination um it, when i was growing up the house that i grew up in uh, up until I was in fifth grade, there was a house like this across the street, just Caddy Corner. I lived on a corner in just Caddy Corner. There was a house like this. It was big and it was scary and it was eh, just a little bit run down. It's not like it was in complete disrepair or anything, but it was old and it had like an eight foot hedge all the way around it. And wow, <laughs> and we and we never saw people going in or coming out. I don't even know if people lived there. They probably did. I'm sure if I asked my parents, they could have told me who lived there. But (laughs) it was more fun to just kind of think of it as this spooky, (laughs) creepy house. And that's, that's what's going on here. 
and what a cliche that is, right? Like how many movies, horror movies or just otherwise, or just these sort of kid adventure movies, either as a main plot or as sort of a side thread, have this idea that in this perfectly manicured, nice suburban neighborhood, there's this one rundown place that is spooky and has a lot of, you know, lore surrounding it by the local children or whatever that does this actually happen? I guess yeah, you well, you said yeah, there's one does. in your neighborhood. You know, there are always some places like that. So I guess it it's kind of a trope, right? Yeah. It, it's great material <laughs> for this sort of thing. Right. I, I think so, too. L- like I said, I mean, it's just just the very opening scene. Even the opening image is just the camera shooting through these beautiful auburn leaves uh, and showing us this beautiful fall landscape and this adorable little blonde girl missing her front <laughs> teeth is uh, flying down the sidewalk on her tricycle and she's avoiding trash bags and piles of leaves and it's just it's so stinking cute <laughs> it's just, and she's singing and talking to herself it's so cute but she ends up getting her tricycle stuck in this one particular lawn and she's the, the, the front wheel is somehow off the ground so she's just spinning and spinning the wheel and can't get it going and it's in front of this old scary house, and this scary old man comes out, and we find out that his name is Mr. Nebercracker. And he's freak, he's scary looking. Yeah. He looks like, kind of like the Crypt Keeper, or like Gollum, yeah. uh, or something like that. Now, he's voiced by Steve Buscemi. <laughs> That's so funny. I never would have guessed. I wouldn't either. He does a character voice. I never would have guessed uh, it was him. But he's good, and he's very effective. The main characters, the little kids, were child actors, and I don't recognize them. But the there are tons of adult actors in here are, who are big name people, and Steve Buscemi is a great actor. Um, the reason that I brought up the looks of the old man is because <laughs> he looks a little bit like Steve Buscemi. He does. Well... He's got the funny teeth, right? Yeah. (laughs) That's like 50% of it right there. (laughs) Steve Buscemi is not a handsome man, but he is a fine actor. And I will forever and always have so much respect and admiration for Steve Buscemi because before he was an actor, he was a New York City firefighter. Mm. And on 9-11, he went to Ground Zero and worked side by side with those firefighters getting people out of there and that's 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 amazing that's pretty awesome yeah you know he's he's typical he's the typical creepy old guy skinny gaunt uh you know wife beater shirt and he grabs this little girl and he screams at her get off my lord <laughs> it's so over the top, but eventually, contextually, you understand that he's warning these children away for a very real reason. Yeah. But he just seems so mean. Like, she runs away and she turns back around. She's like, my tricycle. And he picks it up and he breaks it. He breaks the uh, front wheel off and then he takes it inside his house. As he's going back in his house, he looks back over his shoulder and we get a different perspective seeing him through a camera lens and um, a a camera clicks and takes a picture of him and it turns out that the kid across the street his name is DJ and he's been watching this guy across the street taking toys from kids and yelling at kids and he's kind of been chronicling this he's got all these pictures and stuff he's a scrawny kid there's a lot of uh, scrawny chubby <laughs> duos um, <laughs> yeah. in, in the story. But his friend is this chubby kid named Chowder who's super funny. And it's the day before Halloween. DJ is starting to go through puberty and thinks that he may be getting too old to trick or treat, which totally bums out his friend. And DJ's parents leave right at the very beginning of the movie. I don't, did they even say where they were going? Like, oh gosh, I don't remember. I think they did, but I don't remember where it was. Yeah. They leave right at the beginning and then they're gone like, yeah. <laughs> for the whole rest of the time. But his, his parents uh, are voiced by Catherine O'Hara and the late, great Fred Willard. 
who's just a, a comedic genius and who only passed away, I think, within the last year. And they're in it so so little. Yeah. But I love both. I, I am madly in love with both of them as uh, actors. They're, they're fantastic. You know, uh, it, it's weird, and this has always struck me as strange, is that these movies, especially when we started to see a lot more animated movies, and I think it was Shrek, or maybe it was one of the earlier Disney, I don't remember, where they, they're taking famous people who are voicing um, characters, but otherwise, like, the characters don't look like the famous people, right. and even when people say, hey, that's that guy, like, you don't know. Like, you can't even tell, because, for for example, Steve Buscemi is doing another voice, right? Like, I've always wondered, what is the point, except that you think that somehow people are going to be attracted to this movie because it has these famous names attached to it, when at the end of the day, it didn't matter if this guy was nobody McNobodyson, you know? Sure, uh, right. And so I, I find it weird. I found the casting choice of this movie weird, because you got these actors that like you and I wouldn't know. I don't think your average person. I think actually the two of the kid actors, the two boys were like Nickelodeon actors, but mm-hmm. hardly like drawing star power. And then you have these major stars like you just rattled off uh, who are playing these small parts. Yeah. And you don't even know it's them and they're not their characters aren't modeled after them. It's so strange, right? I, I just don't get it. Well, I, I mean there are great people in this, like Maggie Jillen Hall voices the babysitter, but she too kind of does a character voice. I don't think that I would have recognized Kathleen her. Kathleen Turner is in this. My God. <laughs> yeah. Who is she? I don't even remember. Oh goodness. Like I mean romancing the stone and uh Oh no no, I know who she is. Oh, but it, oh, oh she's the wife. She's that, the, uh, yeah. That's right. Crazy, right? Well, and now we're getting this the spoiler <laughs> stuff. But yeah. <laughs> right. Oh gosh, she's huge. Um Jason Lee, uh yes. <laughs> it, it it plays a teenage boyfriend. Like you said, Kevin James is a police officer alongside his partner Nick Cannon. John Heater has a tiny cameo role. He's one of the few whose characters kind of look like they modeled the character look after him. They just made him chubby. Mm -hmm. But yeah, all these famous people. It's interesting because animated movies did not star famous actors for the, for the longest time. It was Aladdin. Oh, uh, Robin Williams. Robin Williams broke yeah. that mold. Mm-hmm. Mm. He broke that mold. He was really the first big name actor to take an animated role, um, and after that, then I guess these roles became desirable. I mean, because he was so celebrated, yeah. uh, in, as as he should have been, he was fantastic. But then big famous people started uh, taking these roles, but only after that. Like I know that when Disney. Not himself, but when the production company was writing The Little Mermaid, they wrote Ursula as a B. Arthur type. That was her character mm. description. And once they had it going and they were ready to get uh, the voice actors to do it, they approached B. Arthur and asked her to do it. And she <laughs> – it was a firm no because serious actors didn't do that kind of thing. Oh, Interesting. So everything everything changed uh, with Aladdin, and and you know, I that's great. I guess I, I suppose if you're on the other side of the argument and you want to give other people opportunities, yeah. you know, there's that argument too. Mm. But I do like kind of being able to pick these people out, and 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 especially the people in this movie are people that I. Many of them, people that I'm big fans of. So it's it's fun to see them. Well, real quick, while bef- I mean, we're going to get into the plot. Yeah. But I mean, uh, while we're talking about the creators of the movie, the director of the film is Gil Kennan, uh, and uh, he wrote uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife that's going to be coming out here any minute now. Or, right. Or, yeah, and apparently directed the remake of The Poltergeist, which uh, in 2015? Yeah. I never saw that, so I don't know if that's any good. But then Dan Harmon, one of the two co-writers of the movie, created Community, 
and Rick and Morty, mm-hmm. which are two big, mm-hmm. big things. You know, since then, of course, I'm not at the time that this came out. At the time this came out, this was one of his, I mean, he'd been writing for TV and uh, had a few other little projects, but this was one of his very first screenplays and movies that he uh, that he wrote. So. Well, and there's, there's a lot of hype for Ghostbusters Afterlife, and I'm really looking forward to it. And Me the people too. who are involved, the people who are involved, people like um, Sigourney Weaver and a, a couple of the others have spoken and said... You're going to be surprised. It's really good. It's it's very much in keeping with the first movie. I've seen some of the trailers, and it looks like they're really doing throwbacks to the first movie. Like <laughs> I I'm I'm pretty darn sure that Gozer is going to be, if not the main villain, one of the main villains. And like the the demon dogs from the first one are oh. back, and the stay pu- <laughs> the stay puffed you know thing is there. Can they get, can they get Rick Moranis back? That's that's the key. Oh, can they, if can only. they get him out of retirement? Yeah, I don't think they did, but most everybody else who's still with us um, is involved. But on the other hand. I did see the Poltergeist remake, and it was terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's one of those movies. It's hard to recapture the original magic, right? Well, that's the thing. I yeah, I I have to be fair in that the original we've not done it, and and I can't believe that we haven't because it is favorite quite literally one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh. I I absolutely love that movie. Deeply impacted me as a child. My God. <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. Yeah. And we we did part two, and I liked part two. Part three, most people think is absolute garbage i loved it when i was a kid whatever yeah. but now back to the movie that we're talking about <laughs> monster house <laughs> yeah so it, it's the day before halloween and chowder comes over and he's got this new base baseball basketball that um you know they shoot some hoops with or whatever but uh eventually chowder tries to make some shot and it uh, rebounds right into his face and bounces off his face and goes over into Nebercracker's lawn. And at first, they're basically like, oh, well, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Basketball. <laughs> yeah, something goes on Nebercracker's lawn. That's it. Bye-bye. But Chowder's like, I, I paid $28 for that ball, and I really want it. And I, th- I-, I think he cries, which is actually kind of cute, because <laughs> that would have been me when I was a kid. I would have cried. But the the they don't see anything. Nebercracker doesn't come out to collect it or whatever, so they think that he might be asleep or something. So DJ goes out to get it, but um, Nebercracker does come out, and, and he grabs DJ and picks him up and holds him up over his head and says yells. I mean, he yells everything. This place is not a playground for children. Why can't you respect that? Why can't you just stay away from her? And then he freezes. (laughs) And it's a little confusing because it kind of seems like maybe he has a heart attack because he he falls over and is seemingly unconscious and the ambulance comes and takes him away and the boys are convinced that he's dead dj thinks he killed him yeah i, I thought he was dead i mean the way it's i thought treated, he was too they haul him out on a gurney you know with a sheet draped over it and everything i thought man this is kind of dark for the for this movie and then even a nice touch as the gurney is going across the lawn it gets stuck because some pieces of grass have have wrapped themselves around one of the wheels like it's tr- like it's trying to grab it and pull it back. Yeah. These little touches early in the movie where you see the house has a little bit of a, right. a sentience about it, yeah. The movie does not hide that from you. Like no. you know that there's something going on right away and as soon as he falls and as he's being taken away, you can tell that something awakens in the house. And the house itself looks like a monster like it only has two windows where eyes would be Mm -hmm. and then the front door looks like where the mouth would be and as they're taking nebercracker away you get the perspective through one of the windows and you see a tiny little crack you know uh, make its way up so you know that there's something going on and dj finds a key on the lawn i guess it must have fallen out of nebercracker's pants or something And then the babysitter shows up, and she's very stereotypical, like, not goth, but kind of alternative, doesn't give a care. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you're really restricting yourself, Greg. I am so proud of you, actually. Well, (laughs) it's funny because this would be, the, the movie 
clearly doesn't take place in modern day. No. I was trying to figure out while we were watching it, as soon as the landline stuff started popping up, I was trying to figure out what, what year, what era that might be set in. Well, and she pops in a cassette in the stereo. Yeah. So, I mean, she probably wouldn't be goth at this point, but more like uh, just like into heavy metal or or uh, yeah. or the hair bands, which that was me. I didn't dress like it, but I was so into that music. <laughs> in IMDb, it says 1983. Somewhere else it said based on some of the stuff, 1986, 1987. I think it's later 80s for sure. Yeah. But. Which is great. It yes. was a great time. I mean, you know, that was the, that was our childhood. Exactly. <laughs> we, we could we could go off the rails again if we started talking about how much we loved these. Oh, I know. I mean, we would have been about these kids' age. Yeah. And maybe a, a tiny little bit younger, but yeah, well, I mean, this was our childhood, and it well, feels so familiar. Like, <laughs> like you said earlier, too, this the movie has a bit of the feel of those child adventure movies like Goonies or whatever, uh-huh. Adventures in Babysitting that we had in the 80s as well. So it, it, stylistically, it's also kind of a throwback to that as well, you know, thematically. Oh, right, and, and it plays right to us. But I think that kids can still relate like kids oh, aren't yeah. going to be thinking kids aren't going to be thinking what era does this take place in? No. you know like they're just <laughs> they're just going to go with it but for us it's nostalgic and well they might be like well why don't they pull out their cell phones and light things up a little bit or <laughs> right, call the <right>. mom <laughs> so babysitter shows up dj uh, goes to bed and there's kind of a spooky scene where he lays down in his bed and the shadow of the house stretches out from his window and uh, and turns into a giant arm that like lunges at him but then he wakes up like it was a nightmare but immediately after that he gets a strange call and he hangs up on it but the phone immediately rings again and so he picks it up and he just hears these weird noises so again (laughs) big throwback to the 80s he hangs up and hits star 69 (laughs) (laughs) that's fantastic (laughs) and and it's like let's see how you like it and the phone rings and rings but nobody picks it up but then he kind of hears something, and he opens up his window, and he realizes the phone is ringing in Nebercracker's house. So he yeah. thinks that somebody is calling from Nebercracker's house, but he believes Nebercracker is dead. So all of this is very spooky to him. Yeah. A guy named Bones shows up. This is a guy that's voiced by Jason Lee, and he's Z's boyfriend or boyfriend interest, and he's a douche and oh he's he's a not very nice guy Um, and and there's a you know there's a scene where he kind of picks on dj or whatever but dj then overhears the two of them talking downstairs when i was 10 years old i had a kite awesome kite i could fly it so high you couldn't see it one day it crashed down I followed the string, and it ended right over there, across the street, right at the edge of his lawn. Did he take your kite? Yeah, he takes whatever lands on his lawn. But that's not the point. The point is is that I saw him talking to his house and kissing it. (laughs) I'm trying to figure out how that works. Right, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) And, and he could be totally making it up because, like, he's going in for a kiss. Like, it uh-huh. could just be, you know, flirty or whatever. And it, but then he's like, and you know what he did to his wife, right? And Z's like, no. And he's like, he ate her. And I don't know. He does something that irritates her. And so she throws him out of the house. And, and he goes across the lawn. I guess we're supposed to think that he's a little drunk. He's drinking a beer. And he throws the beer bottle on the lawn and kind of taunts the house because he doesn't think anybody's there. But then the door opens, and in this lurid red light, his kite is floating right in the front door. (laughs) And there are – apparently – I didn't pick up on him, but I read about him. Apparently there are several kind of throwbacks to Stephen King. Um, and this wasn't one of the ones that was was listed, but this was so it to oh me. Oh my gosh, it was so obviously it. I couldn't believe that wasn't listed in the trivia. Maybe maybe yeah. we're going to have to make our mark on the IMDb trivia page after. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's just like, you know, <clears throat> Pennywise luring Georgie with the boat or luring any of these kids with images of what they want to see. Red balloon. This is a red kite floating. Uh-huh. I mean, it's just the same. <laughs> it's cute. 
and it's spooky. It's actually pretty spooky. It is. Um, and he gets lured in and presumably eaten by the house. Well, at, isn't this at the point where the... It's pretty early on in any case. I think it's now where the house actually does metamorphosize a little bit, right? Like the door opens yeah, all up. all that and... happens... Well, DJ, DJ sees some... No, DJ just... I don't remember if he sees the boyfriend. I don't think he sees the boyfriend get eaten, but he knows something's going on. So he calls Chowder and they meet at this construction site for no apparent reason other than we need to know that it's there so they can return to it later. And he says, the house is haunted. I'm sure of it. It did something to the boyfriend. Help me. And so they go back and the Chowder is like, well, I'll ding dong ditch it to prove to you that it's not haunted. And he does. And that's when it does just straight up turn into a huge monster like it's yeah. just a head you know like, <laughs> but it but it's a huge scary head with this long like hallway carpet tongue that can the... roll out and like grab people and and they just barely escape, but it's frightening. It like is, I yeah. wasn't scared, but the imagery is really quite frightening in a very good way like i really liked it i thought that it was very spooky appropriate for kids but yeah i don't know i just really liked it i i I don't have anything bad to say about it it does make me wonder because there is a tendency to soften things up a little bit nowadays and to throw in a lot of funny ironic humor and and this this movie's got quite a bit of humor in it but it's it's a different tone still I, i wonder if this were made like say in 2021 if if the house itself wouldn't have been a little jokey or a little cartoonish, or a little silly. You know what I mean? At times, at times. But no, it's pretty terrifying throughout. And I think that works in this movie's favor, really. You know, that the house itself is not... It's dead serious. That's played for seriousness. You know, the spookiness of this house, and the the monster that it is. is And the threat, and the danger. Yeah, it's going to eat them all. (laughs) Right, and it really does. You know, it's it's, uh, legit danger. At one point, they watch it eat a dog. I, I think that's later, I guess. But these these people, you presume these people are goners, mm-hmm. the, the, the people that it eats. And it does. And it, it, it eats the boyfriend. It eats a dog. One of my favorite parts of the movie is the next morning, there's a <laughs> knock at the door, a persistent or, or doorbell ringing or something. And it's this cute, pigtailed, redhead girl. And... She's my absolute favorite character because, (laughs) first of all, she's genius. She's going door to door with this wagon full of Halloween candy on Halloween morning, and she's selling Halloween candy to people to give out for trick-or-treaters, and she's got a whole spiel about it. And I'm like, this girl is going to grow up and conquer the world. (laughs) And I... I was thinking at the time, what a brilliant idea. Why has nobody really done that, right? Like, there's so many people so selling smart. crappy candy bars and stuff door to door on random times. Or you got the Girl Scout cookies, but this Halloween candy door to door to home. Oh, she would make Halloween. bank. Oh, if a kid if a kid showed up at my door on Halloween morning, of course I wouldn't have bought any candy already because I put everything off to the last minute. And you know, she she's right there. You know, like. Uh, this girl would make bank. But of course she um, meets up with the uh, babysitter and she does her whole spiel and eventually the babysitter's like, yeah, I don't live here. Babysitter? Mm-hmm. <sighs> okay, let's cut the crap. Maybe the parents you work for left you $40 in emergency money. Maybe they left me 30 Maybe you give me 20 I write a receipt for 30 and you pocket 10 Maybe. And... I want two extra bags of peanut clusters. One bag, and I'll toss in a licorice whip. You're good. (laughs) Genius! So smart. (laughs) I loved it. (laughs) But then, so she leaves, and the boys have been up all night just watching the house and peeing in Mountain Dew bottles because they they don't want to take their their eyes off. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so gross so gross but totally something that me and my friends would have done like so gross but we totally would have done it like we can't leave the we can't leave the room 
But anyway, <laughs> so they're they're watching out the window and they see the little redhead headed towards the monster house and like. Mr. Nebercracker has signs up like beware go away and like the lawn is sucking the signs down so she's not forewarned and they run out um, and she's walking up the walkway and they're yelling for her but then the house the house almost eats her like it's a great scene like it shoots up the panels like the cement panels of the sidewalk the walkway yeah like she trips into her wagon and so her it's just maneuvering her wagon down these panels towards its mouth the front door and at the very last minute they save her but it's a great super exciting scene and then she basically joins their boys club and is in it with them from then on which is also classic right you got the boys club gets a girl (laughs) <laughs> Gets a smart girl. Yeah, a, a <laughs> smart girl, a pretty girl, and of course they're both just in love with her. And, yeah. and I don't blame them. I would have been too. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's she's smart. She's pretty. She's tough. Like she's great. That's when they see the dog get grabbed. So she calls the police. And and they they head over to the house and Chowder gets tempted by his basketball, but the other two keep him from falling for it. And then the stupid police <laughs> arrive. It's hard. I'm I'm really used. Like even in my notes, there's bad words. I'm trying really hard. The stupid police arrive. Dumb. Yeah, I mean they're dumb. And and Kevin James. I'm really not a big Kevin James fan. I know oh, I there like are him. a lot. Yeah, I know there are a lot of Kevin James fans. His you know, he is in the Adam Sandler school, and they work together a lot. And yeah, but you know what? It's he just has really silly. A charm about him that Adam Sandler. You know, Adam Sandler's kind of smarmy and cocky, and Kevin James just has kind of a charming, like oafish, but heart of gold. Yeah. I, I have to admit, like, what was it? Paul Blart Mall Cop. That was a movie I oh, watched gosh. by accident, and I was not expecting to enjoy it, and I I kind of liked it. <laughs> oh, well, see, now I feel like I should give it a chance because it looked so stupid. It, there's just most of the... it is stupid. It's one of those really stupid movies, but there's something about it that he just kind of elevates it a little bit into the, like just kind of oh this guy this charming guy you know kind of thing. Well, if it ever happens to be on, I'll give well, it a chance. I'm not saying we'll I'm not saying don't get me wrong. I don't want letters afterwards like Todd from Two Guys in a Chainsaw said everybody run out and see Paul Blart Mall Cop as soon as you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, he's the typical doofy, overweight cop, doesn't take anything seriously, makes stupid cop donut jokes and stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> um His partner is a a black officer, again, one thin, one chubby, and the partner cop is played by Nick Cannon, who I don't have anything against, but, like, I'm not a huge fan of his either. He he plays this very silly, but, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's written that way. Yeah. They're supposed to be dumb. It's kind of weak, though. Uh, that that character was weak. Uh. It's, a, it's a little stereotypical. Yeah. <laughs> that, too. It bothered me a little bit. And as being the only person of color in the movie, you know, it was also a little cringy, I thought. But uh, yeah. yeah, it reminded me of someone, but I, I can't think of it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Whatever they show, of course, they don't believe. DJ tries to trigger the house, but it doesn't fall for it. And so they're no help. So they decide to go to an expert. Chowder knows of this, like, expert, because I guess he's a video game expert, so that makes him an expert on monsters or something. And um, <laughs> his name is Skull. Skull. And he's only got in this... Skull and Bones. <laughs> yeah. Which I guess Great. there was originally a subplot where those two were in a band, and they, I don't know, had some falling out or something, but the subplot kind of got cut but this is john heater and he sounds like john heater and his face looks like john heater and i think john john heater i've not i've never seen in anything where he displayed any real type of range but the characters that he plays are hilarious like (laughs) he's just really funny he doesn't have a whole lot to do here but he says that he has heard of Domus Magtipolis, which is, I have no idea if this is any kind of real thing or if he's just making up words, but it's when a building is possessed by a human soul, and it turns out that he's right, and he says, in these instances, you gotta strike at the heart, and so they're like, well, what's the heart of a house? And they're like, well, ever since Nebercracker 
was gone, there's been smoke coming out of the chimney. So maybe the heart is uh, the furnace. So they go back home and make some Home Alone plans. <laughs> you know, these these great, you know, like drawn out in marker plans for their how they're going to take it down. And part of the plan is, I guess, Chowder's dad is a pharmacist. And yeah. so he has to go to the pharmacy and steal a bunch of cold medicine. Which <laughs> probably. I, like, <laughs> I hope kids don't think that's something that's OK. Like, yeah. Yeah. really probably get in some big trouble for that and like at first he's like no I don't want to do it I'm not going to do it and then Jenny's like well I really think you should and he's like yeah I, I'm going to I definitely want to <laughs> I mean he's either going to put a house to sleep or make meth we'll see it depends meth. on which, right. which what region of the thinking. country he's <laughs> living in right <laughs> Maybe a little plus bit this was obviously in the 1980s because the cold medication wasn't locked wasn't behind, behind the glass counter. door <laughs> <laughs> that dates it more than anything else <laughs> good times good uh, times the days we could just buy cold medicine whenever we wanted right <laughs> off the shelf <laughs> oh gosh now like if you really need it like you have to oh your say, cold is you can, over you, by the you time can, you can yeah, get the medicine. You can, you can buy a little bit in your hometown, but then you have to drive a half an hour away to get more if you need it because they're they're watching you. And you end up on a list somewhere, you know. <laughs> what happens when you buy that second bottle? It's like they look at you. <laughs> Alarm sound at the FBI office or something. <laughs> I wouldn't even risk it. Don't even buy no, it. No, it's real. It's a real <laughs> issue. I have, like, people, seriously, like, people, I have people in my life who talk about it. Like, I'm out of my NyQuil. Where can I go to get it? <laughs> We're like drug uh, dealers. Uh, who's yeah, got I the, you, I got a NyQuil guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so he does it. He, uh, he steals it, and they, they rig up this dummy. First of all, they, they, they cross the street in disguise in trash cans, which I thought was hilarious and i know we've seen it in a movie before but i can't remember what it was maybe is it et or yeah yeah i think it was et they're in uh trash cans and like scooting across the street super <laughs> cute and then they have this dummy in a wagon or no no it's it, they, they make up a vacuum cleaner <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like a self-propelled vacuum cleaner mm. and they put a mask on it and like d dress it up and it's super cute jenny rings the doorbell with a slingshot like we got some uh beverly marsh action going on here <laughs> and they send the dummy up and the house starts to wake up like it's going to eat the dummy but then the cops show up because they think that these kids are you know, trying to break in or do something, playing pranks or or yeah. something, and they the cops discover the cough syrup, so they're gonna take the kids to jail. Like, <laughs> 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 so they lock them in the back of the cop car. Now suddenly it is the nineties. <laughs> yeah. Oh right. And so they lock the kids in the back seat of the cop car, which of course we all know mean they're stuck there; they can't get out. But the cops hear something in the house. And so they go up and they are attacked like a tree grabs one of them and is throwing it around and it it ends up eating both of the cops and then it attacks the cop car and like picks up the cop car and is like pulling it towards its mouth and they get pulled inside and the cop car gets like cut in half when the the house is eating people the floorboards of the foyer open up like this big gullet. And um, th they almost get pulled into the gullet, but at the very last second, they manage to escape, but they are locked in the house. The house repairs itself and the gullet closes, and so the kids think that the house must think that it ate them and it must be sleeping now, so they need to find the heart of the house. And so they look around, and... <sighs> They find all these explosives around the house, which seems random. Yeah. There's a reason for it. And they see pictures of Nebercracker and his wife. And Nebercracker is this very scrawny guy, and his wife is morbidly obese. Like, I mean, she's literally a circus freak. I don't like, I don't <laughs> like, to, yeah. I don't like talking about people's, <laughs> you know, sizes. Wait, because yeah. I'm not one to talk. <laughs> <laughs> But she's intentionally morbidly obese. 
and they find out, uh, you know, they, they just get a little history from looking at pictures and stuff, and they see that Nebercracker was in the service. I don't know if it was Army or what, but whatever he was in, he was on the demolition squad. And the house wakes up and, like, coughs and spits something out, and they see this chandelier-type thing hanging down. The girl, Jenny's like, oh, it must have, something must have tickled its uvula. That's its uvula. <laughs> And Chowder's like, oh, so it's a girl house. <laughs> 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 Which is so funny. Yeah. And kids would never get it. No. Oh, I love that. I love in children's movies when they throw jokes to the adults that would go completely over the kids' heads. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even if the kids did get it, like, there's nothing dirty about that, you know? Yeah. Like, it's just about girl parts whatever (laughs) but they end up falling i guess through a hole or the the gullet or something and they find all the toys that have been um stolen and they find this cage and it's it's labeled constance the giantess and it's locked but dj the key that he found opens it and when they open it up there's a her dead body encased in cement like that's dark for yeah it's movie <laughs> it really is i mean and then then you get the backstory of uh, of the yeah. house and and Constance. and the backstory yeah well and and stuff go, like there's other action that goes in here they end up the the house knows they're in there and and they're threatened but jenny like jumps up and swings on the gullet so it chokes and they get spit out uh, and then an ambulance, like as they're running across the street, they never look both ways. <laughs> they're running across the street. DJ gets hit by an ambulance, but he's okay. But Nebercracker is back. He had just broken his arm. I don't know if he had passed out or what, but he just has a broken arm. He yells at them, don't you know what this day is? I'm running out of time. Honey, I'm home. And then he says, the house is her. And that's when we get the backstory. And frankly, like, this movie is for kids, and I think that kids can totally appreciate it and, and be fine with it. But this backstory is really heartbreaking. Yeah. It, it's really sad. It makes me sad just even talking about it. I mean, basically, he, he meets her as a young man. She's in a circus freak show. She's not happy about it. She's not just a, a overweight. She's like a giantess, apparently. She's super tall. Yeah. And, of course, he's really, really small and thin, and so it's kind of cute. Um, and so, you know, he falls in love with her and uh, rescues her from the circus and they get married. Yeah, he says, he says, I'll take you away from all this. Do you want that? Not only is she mm. a circus performer, but she's like a cage. She's caged. Yeah, like, literally. She Which was... lives in this cage. Um, and it seems like, I don't know, e- like when he talks to her, it's almost like nobody ever talks to her. Like she almost doesn't even know how to talk. And people are just horrible to her, which I'm sure was real. You know, oh, yeah. um, back in those days of, of freak shows, these people were horribly abused. Um, one of these days, we really should do freaks. Yeah. I've never seen it, and I am, uh, I'm really, really intrigued. It's, it's a good one. I like it. For a classic horror movie especially, it's one of the more disturbing ones. Yeah. But, you know, I just, I feel... A, he seems to love her and and he takes her away and he he starts building her this house that's that's you know their house and um it, it's no it's in the middle of nowhere you know apparently they're the first house in the development but she's still being abused like kids are throwing rocks at her and stuff and when she's abused she gets super angry which yeah. is sad but understandable and she loses control and and she screams it's my house and that just breaks my heart like your house if nowhere else should be your sanctuary right. and she's not even safe there and before the house is even built as she's raving against these kids who are are abusing her she falls into the construction and dies and the cement falls on top of her and apparently that's just where she stayed and um he finished the house but he says she died but she didn't leave 
Yeah. And um, he explains how he has to take all of these precautions on Halloween because if kids, you know, come to the door or play pranks or whatever, she gets angry and <laughs> kills them. I guess. <laughs> right, and that's when it turns into you know that's when it, then the, in Act Three it's very action heavy. Yeah. The house complete you know completely transform. It uproots itself. It chases them to this quarry slash slash construction site that we had seen before. And there's a lot of action that goes on there. The house is trying to get the kids and kill the kids, and there are a lot of very close moments. And the kids, you know, a couple of them, Jenny and uh, DJ, fall into the quarry, and Chowder is is in, like, a crane trying to fight her or get her to fall into the quarry or something. And there's a, a sweet moment where the the house is trying to attack the kids and Nebercracker throws a brick at her and she turns around and starts coming towards him. But right when she gets to him, she stops and they just look at each other mm. and they love each other. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's so sad. And he says to her, Oh, my sweet. You've been a bad girl, haven't you? You've hurt people. Oh, Constance. Well, we've always known this day would come, haven't we? Oh. Now, I, I, I have to make things right. I, I have to make things right. I've always done what's best for you, haven't I? Haven't I, girl? And he lights dynamite, but the house grabs him. But Chowder kind of saves him with uh, the bulldozer, but DJ, I don't know. They have to, like, they swing on a cord or something. and it's super action-heavy. Yeah, the, the house falls into the pit and is, is totally broken, but then it rebuilds itself and DJ has to throw the dynamite and he throws it and it goes in the chimney and the house explodes and everybody is okay and Nebercracker is sad but relieved yeah and the last scene is there's a long line of people (laughs) (laughs) at the hole (laughs) Walking up to the hole where the kids and Nebercracker are returning all of the things that had been stolen from the kids off of their lawn. And the cute tricycle girl comes and Nebercracker gives her her tricycle back. And the kids are all friends. You know, Jenny and the boys, you know, are they've bonded and, and they're friends. And Nebercracker is kind of, he's kind of nice. But the last thing he says to them is, and stay off my lawn. <laughs> 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 Which was kind of like with a smile, like it's like a smirk, like... It's cute. It's funny. And then the credits roll. And in the credits, we see the hole where Nebercracker's house was. And all of the people that had been eaten throughout the movie, Bones and the dog and the cops, crawl out and are, like, confused. And I guess that they, the studio kind of forced them to do that. Like, Otherwise, the only way to get a PG rating, right? Yeah, it would have been too dark if they were actually dead. And it doesn't bother me. It's a kids' movie. That's fine. You know, let let them be okay. That's fine. (laughs) (laughs) It did feel. I will say though that the ending felt awfully long. Like once the main action is over, you know, pretty much the movie needs to wrap up. You know, the movie's done. And I felt like all this stuff at the end was just kind of dragging, even before they started climbing out of the hole. And I, I was kind of thinking, oh, God, when is this movie going to end? thought there might be some other twist or something. And no, it's just them kind of getting out. And Z is apparently now dating Skull, which Bones finds out. And then, <laughs> like, like, a dog pisses on a jack-o'-lantern to put it out. I mean, 
it's so so much like come on end already that's all i felt at the end <laughs> i don't know i actually but it was thought, cute yeah it i thought cute. that it was very cute and sweet and i like that i am such a sucker though for that type of thing i yeah. love sweet cute stuff i love kids movies even not scary ones like animated movies kids movies i love them oh, yeah you know we we eat them up at our house. It's certainly not the only thing we watch or even something that we watch regularly, but we love them. Like, and, and oh, yeah. they, like, they always make me cry. Like those despicable me movies, like, especially the first <laughs> one, like at the end, I'm like weeping. Oh, the first one. <laughs> Every Pixar movie ever. Yes. Except for Cars 2. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm the same way. Love them. Love this movie. If I had kids, I would totally show it to them. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's so, it's such a great Halloween movie, uh, just for this time of year. You know, I decided this year that I was going to do the novel, something wicked this way comes with my, oh. my students. And, uh, I hadn't read it in years and picking it up and just reading the first few pages. The first few pages are all about the magical month of October. And, uh, mm. He's a wizard at the window. Uh, and this movie gave me those same feelings. It's just, I love this time of year. I love the fall. I just wish it could be fall all year long. I love Halloween. And this just, it, it fits perfectly for that. And it's fun. I, I, I'm glad I chose it. I know that it's um, unorthodox for us but i don't care <laughs> it's our podcast and we'll do what we want <laughs> <laughs> da- darn it darn it to heck we will do whatever we want with our parents approval <laughs> of course <laughs> All right. Anyway, thank you for listening. We, I hope I didn't disappoint you with a non-traditional horror movie, but I really do have a feeling that most of our listeners and, and fellow horror fans do appreciate this kind of stuff. I, I Not all of you, I'm sure, but um, I'm sure many of you do. And if you do, let us know. Let us know if there are other things like this that you'd like us to take a look at or, you know, anything at all. Any requests that you have, uh, we always put those on our list and try to get around to them as soon as we can. If you liked this episode, as always, um, please feel free to share it with a friend. Of course, you can find us anywhere you can find your favorite podcasts, or you can just Google Two Guys in a Chainsaw Podcast and you'll find our Facebook page, our Twitter, which I've never looked at. I, Todd, I hope that you're. I hope that you're managing the Twitter because I've never even looked at it. Uh, every now and then, I get a notification that somebody responded to us. It's not our most active means of communication so far. No, but people do private message us on uh, Facebook, and we always respond because we really, really do enjoy engaging with you. It's one of the most fun elements of of doing this show. And we should be back, I think, with one more horror Halloween movie. <laughs> but until next time, I'm Craig. And I'm Todd. With two guys in a chainsaw. Ah.